Hi Fools, welcome to Biotech Banter, the Motley Fools biotech focused investing show. I'm healthcare analyst David Williamson and I'm joined as usual by Brian Arelli, our biotech expert. Now Brian, we had a uh, busy week last week. Uh, there were some biotechs that, that sold off right at the end of the week uh, that was really led by Endocyte, which uh, got cut in half after a uh, drug trial didn't go their way. We saw some uh, drop on earnings as well as Pharmacyclics uh, lost about 10%. Uh, Seattle Genetics lost about 10%. Um, why don't you go over what happened with these three stocks? Yeah, they all happened on Friday, which, you know, pretty much every day you got some biotech going down. Um, so three in one day is not really that surprising. Um, the first one, Seattle Genetics, um, they sell at Citrus, which is a, a cancer drug, um, and it only went up 19. The sales only went up 19 percent. Investors seemed a, a little worried about that. I'm not sure that they really should be because um, Seattle Genetics is trying to expand it into other indications, other to treat other types of cancer. And so I think that's really where investors should be focused on, not the not the indications that it's approved for right now. So I'm not sure that sales right now. Um, necessarily uh, translate into its peak sales. That's going to be determined by whether the clinical trials uh, are positive that it's running right now. Uh, yeah, how, how they play out. Inve you know, biotech investors aren't known for their patience, though. So I think, uh, you know, when they were looking at the potential sales for Etcetras and uh, where they are now, uh, there's probably a little disappointment, even if it is misplaced. Uh, let's move on to Pharmacyclics, which also uh, had a rough go of it on earnings. But I don't think it was so much the earnings themselves, but uh, it was, it was kind of one of the stranger conference calls I've seen where management gave out a guidance, uh, which I believe was uh, around 295, 300 million for the year, which, which was essentially flat growth for their flagship drug, Imbruvica. Yeah, so it just, uh, it just uh, was approved. So this was the first full quarter that uh, they had sales, and I think sales were at uh, 50, a little over $50 million. Uh, so um, they're not really guiding for much uh, uh, growth and that's especially surprising because they just in february they got approved for a second indication a cll uh, which was which is probably a larger indication than a mantle cell uh, lymphoma which they were approved for first um so i think that i think that the potential is there and it could be just that they're sandbagging guidance because they they want to be able to to meet and raise uh, guidance uh, we saw that with the regenerons uh, with ilea pretty much like for three or four or five quarters in a row, um, they just kept raising uh, guidance. And I, you don't know whether it's because management, you know, really thinks it's going to be able to do much better and they're, they're sandbagging or whether, you know, management is pleasantly surprised that they, that they got sales higher than they were expecting. Yeah, it was a really weird call uh, when I was reading over the, the transcript. Uh, it, their guidance really caught everyone off guard because I think most people were expecting, you know, <laughs> obviously some growth, uh, but because um, you just don't you don't want to see that in in what's supposed to be a multi-billion dollar blockbusters drug launch uh, management got really defensive they basically said it was their worst case scenario and that it's not their job to, to stick their neck out uh, that's analysts job to model and, and their job is to uh, to hit or exceed their 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 numbers but um, you know it was just it, it was a little bizarre and, and you know I think it was sort of a self-inflicted wound uh, on the company, I think it's it's raised some questions about what, if management's seeing anything, or like you said, if they're sandbagging uh, to get future earnings beats uh, down the road. Uh, but you know, and we we see we see a lot of biotechs just at launch don't even bother to give guidance, um, and you know, so maybe they would have been better off doing that. Yeah, I, I, I think they probably would have been uh, just to just to say, you know, it's too early for us to give guidance than than give sort of this weird guidance that that threw just about everyone for a loop. Well, let's move on to Endosite, uh, which uh, was down not on earnings, but on unfortunately a clinical trial failure for their lead drug uh, in ovarian cancer. And, and what's sort of interesting about this uh, drug is that it actually had a preliminary approval in the EU uh, before this trial played out. Yeah, um, and it was based on phase two data, and so they sort of approved it, and then I think it was pretty much conditional on the phase three trial becoming positive. So we may not see that that approval um, go through. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, probably unlikely. Well, well, Brian, taking a look at these three stocks, um, you know, they they ruined some people's weekends, I'm sure. But are any of them a bad news buy this week? Uh, Pharmacyclics has pretty much regained all of its. Um, 
all of its its loss that it, it, it that saw that we saw on Friday. So we can throw that out as at least the, the bad news part. Uh, whether it's a buy at this point sort of depends on on whether management is sandbagging um, or if they really think that that's going to be their their sales. They got Johnson and Johnson behind them. Um, that's their partner on the drug. So I, I think it's probably okay, and I wouldn't be too worried if I was an investor. Um, in terms of Seattle Genetics, I really like their their platform. They they add um, conjugates to antibodies, so the antibody targets the drug to the to the cancer cells, and then the the drug at the that's attached to the conjugate um, actually kills the 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 tumor. Um, and so they they have quite a big pipeline, and they also have licensed it out to other drug makers. So I think the their pipeline is what investors should be focused on, and not a citrus sales right now. Um, and then in terms of um, Endocyte, I think it's really hard to tell. Um, that's probably the hardest one of the three. It's it's only three hundred. It's under three hundred million dollars. Um, and Merck is their partner on the drug that that failed, so they're not really paying anything. So whether they go forward or not um, is, you know, they they have a decent pipeline, um, and they also have a platform um, that helps them to develop drugs. So I think at under three hundred million, it's probably not that bad of a. Of a well, you know, under three hundred million, they're almost trading for their cash on hand now. Now, obviously, cash doesn't stick around very often for uh, unprofitable biotechs, but you know, I think that that cushions the blow a little bit. Like you said, Ventafola, it's going to be a, a Merck decision. They have uh, six other drugs in development. Uh, they do have a platform. Uh, because of this failure, it's not really a, a proven platform yet. Uh, but we'll see what happened. And obviously, Ventafolide uh, was in phase two for non-small cell lung cancer. It's, it's going to be up to Merck to see uh, if they push it forward in that indication. Uh, but, you know, I think all three of these stocks are, are pretty interesting and are definitely worth uh, investors putting them on their, their watch list. Well, let's move on to our, our next topic, uh, which is a, a pretty controversial one, and it's drug pricing. And there, there was an interesting story in, in Bloomberg the other week about uh, how drug prices just seem to uh, just shoot up. Uh, it was called the first million dollar drug near after prices double on dozens of treatments. And, and we've really seen an explosion, uh, certainly in, in orphan indications, which I, I think you want to touch on, but you know, also in, in some more mass market drugs like uh, Gilead Savaldi. Yeah, um, you know, it's sort of the, it's the, the story that just won't go away. Every week we seem to have a new uh, story about about how drug pricing and I think the there's cancer drug cancer docs that are complaining now. Um, the thing is, there's they basically have monopolies, right? So unless you get the the government involved, um, it's really difficult for for anybody to do anything about it. Um, the 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 uh, pharmacy uh, benefit managers can sort of and the insurers can sort of do some um, some uh, negotiating, but ultimately, you know, the companies can just say, "Fine, don't buy our buy our drug," and then and then what are they going to do? Go back to their members and say, "Oh no, you can't have this drug because we don't want to pay for it because um, it's too high a price." Um, that becomes a real difficult conversation to have. Yeah, and I think uh, especially we, we're seeing a little push. There was an article today about how uh, you know cancer doctors are, are complaining about the cost of, of some oncology treatments, and it definitely gets touchy when you're talking about end of life care, you know, and, and what is another you know month or so and no overall survival worth. Uh, but these are all six figure drugs generally at, at, at that point. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, I think Savaldi was be, it was such a hot button issue just because of the size of the patient population. Express Scripts is, is seemingly going on a war. They were discussing, you know, what strategic actions they were going to take. I think they're trying to pressure uh, one of the other potential providers of a hepatitis C cure like um, Merck or, or AbbVie is likely the next to market to, to really compete on price. But, you know, there's no obligation for AbbVie to dramatically undercut Gilead. Yeah, and I mean, we saw that with Regeneron and Ilea. Um, they undercut it and it seemed to work uh, pretty well competing against Roche. But that was sort of a little guy against a big guy. Um, and, I, and the, you know, so I'm not sure that I'm not sure that AbbVie is really necessarily going to undercut uh, Gilead. It doesn't really, you're, as you said, it doesn't really have to. Um, I think that, you know, companies, it, it depends on how much value the drug gives the the patient, right? So if you if you can prove that you can save the company the patient money or in the long run, uh, it might act. You know, you might be able to charge more than if 
as you were saying, you you know you're extending life for a month on a cancer drug. Yeah, and I, I and I think that's the uh, the really important differentiator that people are going to focus on because because Gilead's upfront cost is is certainly <laughs> quite a bit, but you know a, a liver transplant uh, is, is going to cost significantly more over time. I mean that's, that's yeah, but of course Gilead's argument. Of, yeah, that's Gilead's argument, and then Germany comes back and says, "Well, do you have proof that, <laughs> that it doesn't cause liver cancer?" Um, because you know Germany is is a hot. You know they really try to negotiate hard, mm -hmm. um, and and so you know and. In those, you know, in those cases, I think when the government can get involved, you know, we see in Europe, most prices in Europe are considerably lower than the U.S. Um, and that's because the citizens are willing to let their government negotiate because they have, you know, they're provided health care through the government. Um, and so then the government can negotiate. And sometimes, you know, we see this in in uh, Great Britain a lot. The 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 service there uh, is a nice um, they you know, they oftentimes don't provide drugs for for their patient, for the patients that are covered under their program, uh, because they they say that it's not worth the benefit isn't really worth the cost. Um, but in the U.S., we don't have that system, so I think it's going to be a lot harder for U.S. Uh, for I think drug prices in the U.S. are going to stay high because there's really no negotiate. There's no way that they can negotiate the price. Yeah, even the Affordable Care Act, which is working to contain costs in the system and bend that cost curve, doesn't really address these high drug prices. So. Um, despite you know, only, you know there may be social pressure on some of these drug companies to change their their business practices, but uh, there's nothing in the law that's going to make them change. So I, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a trend that we'll we'll see continue for uh, for quite some time. Um, all right. Well, let's move on from drug prices to uh, drugs in development because Merck just had their their big analyst day this week, uh, where they went over. Uh, their pipeline, which uh, you know, I, I've argued for a while that it was a it was a pretty underrated pipeline. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think I think it's probably fairly rated. I think people have caught on to uh, to Merck and everything that's going on. Brian, what were some highlights to you uh, from Merck's analyst day in their pipeline? Yeah, what we what we didn't see is any major announcements. So sometimes during these analyst days, the companies will save um, data and then they'll present it at the analyst. Um, day. This wasn't really, they, Merck didn't really do that. No, I think um, the big headline have, was that they sold off their consumer unit for uh, yeah, 14 billion to bear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think they really timed that with their analyst day. I think they were just working on it and that's, that's when it finally got done. Um, so, you know, sometimes they save data in this case, it was more just like an overview of Merck. Um, and so they, they presented, you know, different, different, num you know, different, uh, Drugs and one of the drugs that um, people are really interested in is three four seven five. That's the PD one uh, inhibitor. Um, it it basically shuts off the mechanism that causes uh, that that inhibits can uh, immune cells from attacking cancer. So if you inhibit the inhibitor, then that causes the immune cells to be able to to attack the cancer. Yep, it um, essentially releases the brakes on the immune system. It's it, it's one of these new flagship immuno oncology drugs. Yeah, and Bristol Myers has one too. Um, so that Merck's drug is is already under review. The Padufa date is October 28th, um, and but that's only going to be used as a second line indication after uh, parent, patients have failed Bristol Myers Yervoy. Um, they're running a head-to-head -head trial against Yervoy, so that'll be that'll obviously expand sales considerably um, if that's positive. Um, and then they're running other. Uh, they're running clinical trials and other indications, uh, including lung cancer. Uh, right now, it looks like Bristol Myers is ahead with their PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, yeah, I mean, Br Bristol has been sort of further ahead in development as far as uh, you know what they're pairing it up with in, in their trials. But I think it's really interesting that Merck is going to be first to market. They really pushed as hard as they could to get it there, and I think most people expected Bristol because their drug was was sort of further along in development to be first. But uh, it's it's an aggressive play by Merck, but but I kind of like it because uh, certainly it's it's going to be indicated for people who have failed your avoid. But you know Bristol Myers is running a trial uh, using their PD one drug in conjunction with your avoid, so th there's no reason to think that that Merck's drug won't be used off label. Right, exactly. I mean, that's really the strategy, right? So you get it approved for a small indication, um, and then you, you, as soon as the data comes out, uh, comparing it to your VOI, they may get immediately get sales of, of 
patients taking it instead of Uravoy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the uh, if we can stick on immuno oncology, there was one drug that that I was looking at too. It's it's just in phase one, uh, but it's it's MK forty one sixty six. And uh, unlike PD-1, which sort of releases the brakes, this is a drug that actually stimulates the immune system to attack. So it's, you know, it's it's, it's more of like a it's a cheerleader uh, versus uh, just sort of opening the opening the floodgates. But uh, uh, I think that's that's going to be an interesting product as well. These PD-1 drugs are really sort of the uh, um, you know the the tentpole uh, franchise for immuno oncology platforms. I know Bristol has a number of immuno oncology drugs in development they want to use in conjunction. Merck's Merck's doing the same thing. Um, and I think uh, when you, you mentioned data, I think the, the ASCO conference, uh, we should hopefully get some more data from, from Merck on this. Yeah, and the, the advantage to these immuno-oncology drugs is that, is that the immune system can basically attack any type of cancer. So in, for other drugs, they're, they're attacking specific cancers because those cancers create uh, specific types of genetic mutations, and then the, the drugs go after uh, uh, tumor cells that have those specific mutations. So, you know, you can't necessarily have a, a melanoma drug that also treats lung cancer. Um, but in terms of, you know, when you use the, the immune system, we just basically tell the immune system, go attack cancer. Um, it can go and attack any types of cancer. So I think that's really the reason why people are so excited about these, these types of of drugs is because they'll be able to be used in so many different indications. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that from the Bristol data, which has been a little more robust that the for the people who have responded to the drug, they've been really durable responses. So it's it's really exciting. Uh, sales estimates for, for Merck's drug is around six and a half billion uh, peak, but it, in some ways that, that may actually be low. Uh, but let's move down Merck's pipeline. Did anything else uh, catch your eye? Yeah, so there was Oden Katib. Um, that's an osteoporosis drug, you'll remember. A lot, they, we thought they were going to file for it last uh, with data last year, and then they decided, well, let's just let the trial run a little bit farther um, and get some more safety data because there were some safety issues. So they announced uh, that they are going to file at the end of the end of this year. Um, but you know, that's a pretty complex, that's a pretty crowded space. So I, I don't know that that even if it does get approved, I'm not sure that many doctors are going to use it when there's so many other options that, that might be safer, even if it's, you know, has pretty good efficacy. So you're, uh, you're, you're not as bullish as some analysts putting peak sales closer to a uh, billion dollars, then you think it's going to be kind of a me too drug in that space? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it's really a me too drug in that it has, it doesn't necessarily have the same uh, mechanism of action as all the other drugs, but there's so many osteoporosis drugs and a lot of them, you know, are generic. And so I think it's a really hard space for a new drug to come in and, and compete. Fair enough. Well, is there, uh, wrapping it up, is there anything else that you, uh, that, that caught your eye from the analyst day that our investors need to know about? Yeah. So we've known that, that Merck has a hepatitis C, uh, franchise. And so they have multiple drugs that they're combining to, and they just went into phase three trials, but they announced uh, at the meeting that they're going to test uh, their drugs with Sovaldi um, and try to get it on the on the market that way too. So it's a sort of if you if you can't beat them, join them. Um, and so instead of competing against uh, Gilead, let's just use one of their drugs along with our drugs. And and so the advantage here is that they might be able to lower the time that it takes to to take the drug. So instead of six or eight weeks, um, they're going to try uh, as low as four weeks to see whether they can rid the, the patients of the virus in four weeks using their combination, their drugs plus Sovaldi. That's, uh, that's really interesting because right now, uh, you know, the, the big differentiator, Merck's, Merck's drug is, will be a single pill regimen, which, which gives them an advantage over uh, the other competitors uh, in that space. But uh, w when you looked at the head to head, uh, Sovaldi was they were actually somewhat comparable after uh, 12 weeks, but Savaldi was much better after eight. But if you could reduce that down to four, that would also lower the cost of treatment uh, as well. Um, yeah, unless unless companies just go ahead and, and increase their <laughs> price to, to adjust for the difference. <laughs> that could definitely happen. That could definitely happen. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was that was Merck's pipeline. Let's move on to uh, uh, one of our favorite segments, which is biotech of the week. Now we have a good one queued up. It's Ariad Pharmaceuticals. The this, this stock's been on quite a little bit of a roller coaster ride, though, huh, Brian? Yeah. So they have a leukemia drug called uh, Eclusig, um, and it it was on the market, and people were really excited. Um, it was only approved for second line indication, but people, you know, they, they had a trial going. Um, testing it head-to-head -head against uh, Novartis's Gleevec, 
Um, and so they, you know, inv investors were really excited. And then they sort they they had they had been continuing the the data in the second line indication, um, and they found that there were uh, patients. A lot of patients were getting blood clots, and so they stopped the the first line indication trial. Um, and and then they and so that's why the price dropped. And then eventually the the price of the stock dropped. Um, and then eventually the FDA made them pull it from the market because they were worried that it might get used. Um, in patients that it really shouldn't be. Um, but it went back on the market pretty quickly. Um, and you, from that stock chart, you can see that it actually doubled um, from, from its low uh, to where it is right now. But it's still uh, still pretty far behind where it was before. And yeah, definitely not the same potential that it had now. I mean, they were going to be able to compete with, with uh, Gleevec and then Bristol-Myers also has a, has a drug that's uh, indicated for first line for the same same leukemia. Well, and I think it's tough too because you look at uh, Iclusig and they were going for a number of indications with it, uh, but because of these safety issues, uh, it's going to be kind of stuck as a drug of last resort. I think I think in a lot of them, and certainly it's it's efficacious, but um, uh, at least in what it's approved in uh, right now. But but when you have such serious safety issues, it's hard to get moved up in the treatment ladder. Uh, yeah, they're not that they're they're trying. I mean, so they they have a. They're they're doing uh, clin they're starting clinical trials with lower doses. So hopefully maybe the the efficacy will be there mostly there, um, and and the blood clots will will decrease substantially, and then maybe the risk benefit makes it a little bit, be you know, makes it better, and maybe it can actually be moved into a first line indication. Um, there's also a possibility that you might be able to use it in combination with blood thinners, um, and so maybe the the blood thinners would be able to get rid of the blood clots, and that would solve the the problem with the, the, the side effects. Um, and then, you know, they're trying other indications that are solid tumors and solid tumor. The problem, part of the problem is that, is that patients live so long um, with the leukemia. And so they're taking the drug for a really long time. So if they went into something that has a, has a shorter um, life, uh, life expectancy, they might, the blood clots might not be as big of an issue. That makes sense. Is there anything else in their pipeline that investors should uh, be looking out for? Yeah, they have one um, drug, um, uh, AP26113, and you can guess by the name, uh, it's definitely farther behind um, in the clinic. Uh, it has the same mechanism of action as uh, Pfizer's uh, Exatory, um, and they're testing it in patients that have failed, um, that have failed Pfizer's drug. Well, you know, it's Pfizer's drug. That was one of the the bright spots in in Pfizer's earnings. The you know there was there was pretty good sales growth there in Zalcori. But the, the the problem was it was still only at eighty eight million uh, for the quarter. So yeah, well, it's a small right. So it's it's only lung cancer, and then it's only lung cancers with this certain mutation. I um, mean, I don't remember what it is, but it's it's in the low percentages of total lung cancers have this this mutation. So it works really well on patients that have. This the, on the tumors Specific that have this mutation. Yeah. Mutation, I think it's ALK. -AL um, and but you know, so we're talking about. Uh, I mean, if we're talking about p patients that have failed that indication, uh, failed Pfizer's drug, it's going to be even smaller. So I think it's one of these strategies where you try to get it on the market, even though the sales won't be that great, um, and then try to get off-label use once you can you can prove that it that it's as good as Pfizer's drug. That makes sense, but it still sounds like uh, at the end of the day, Ariad's all about a Clusig and, and what they can do to, uh, you know, salvage uh, some of that potential that they had before. Certainly in the short term. All right. Well, let's move on to the tweet of the week, which is uh, probably my favorite segment where we read a, uh, a popular tweet that was out there. And our tweet this week comes from Luke Timmerman, who uh, was uh, he was quoting Oleg Nodelman, the uh, Founder and managing director of Echo R1 Capital, which is a value-oriented healthcare fund, and uh, Nodelman said, "You can invest in a moldy piece of pizza. It's biologically active, has a 10% chance of working. Just a question of valuation." Brian, what's uh, what's your, your take on this tweet? It's a, it's a pretty good one, I gotta say. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we talked about this a little bit last week when we were talking about uh, valuing binary events, and so the idea is that you know you can you can invest in something that you think has more of a chance of failing than succeeding. Um, the only thing is you have to be, you know, you have to believe that the the benefit of it of it succeeding is going to outweigh the 
the cost, uh, the, the decrease if it doesn't succeed. So in case of the moldy pizza, if you expect that moldy pizza is going to increase in value a uh, hundred times, um, and the worst it can do is lose all of its money. If there's a 10% chance of, of it succeeding, um, that's a pretty good investment. The, the only problem is that there's a good chance you're going to lose all your money. So you have to scale back the, the amount that you're going to invest accordingly, because there's a good chance that you lose all your money. I don't know. Moldy don't pizza know. could be a nice lead product for uh, the biotech we need to found. Um, <laughs> do you have a, uh, you know, do you have a, Good example, though, about, uh, you know, um, you know, how how the markets sort of run up and, the, and I guess the demand overall for for biotech drugs and and the way we've seen funding lately that that moldy pizza might might attract uh, investor interest. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in this market, after we've seen stuff, you know, raised so much, I think it's really hard to um, to find those sort of those ideas where the where the even though they're, I mean, I think that sometimes investors are just running into stocks, even though it, it seems like there's more chance that they're going to, you know, they're going to fail than they're going to succeed. Uh, a few years ago, we had, um, um, it was a Carex and, and their partner at turn, Zentaris. Zena, the, yeah, <laughs> Zentaris. Um, and they had that, they had that, uh, colorectal cancer drug. Um, and that they sort of, they sort of, they, they ran a phase three trial when they should have really ran a, a second phase two trial. And so there was really no way to know whether the phase three trial was going to be a success. Um, but the pay, but, but investors, especially, you know, way before they started, before they were going to announce data, um, their, the value of the company was pretty small. So I think in, in that case, you know, it was, it was a decent investment and actually it sort of, it sort of wrote, it sort of rose as it was going into the, into the data release. Um, so I think inve- the best investors were, of course, the investors that bought it when it seemed undervalued. And then right before the data came out, um, decided, well, you know, the risk reward isn't really in my favor anymore. And then they sold it. And then, of course, it, they, both companies dropped once once the phase three trial failed. Uh, another example is, is mankind. Um, you know, it, if you can wait long enough for clinical trial results, you can oftentimes um, see big returns even without ever seeing the clinical trial data. So, you know, time is on investor side. And if you're patient, you can find these you know, mankind was trading you know, really low. And then, and then it, you know, just because the clinical trial results were so far, they call them dead, you know, dead stocks. Um, but if you're willing to buy and hold and just wait, um, the, the drug went up considerably, uh, the stock went up considerably well before the, they released the phase three data. Yeah, it's really been just a run up to the, uh, you know, the approval process. And we'll find out what happens with uh, mankind pretty soon as far as uh, FDA approval. Uh, certainly they got the uh, positive adcom vote. And uh, as far as they turn to Zentaris and Carex, it's sort of interesting that uh, Carex is the one that rose from the ashes with uh, Xeranex. I think a lot of people would have bet on uh, Aeterna just because of their larger pipeline. But uh, you just need uh, one good drug. Uh, apparently. But uh, thanks, Brian. Thank you for joining us for Biotech Banter. I hope everyone out there enjoyed this week's show, and we'll see you back next week. Thank you, and full on.